it's Steph again, and welcome to part two of the recipe for knowledge. In part one, we started on an epistemic journey we're going to continue today. We're considering what ingredients are individually necessary or required for knowledge, and what combination of ingredients is sufficient, is enough. To test each candidate recipe, we can do two things. First, we can take examples that we think are cases of knowledge and see if they're identified as such under the given account. Second, we can take examples that we wouldn't want to consider knowledge and see if they're ruled out. Gettier type cases, which we discussed last time, take the latter approach. They are cases where our intuition is that someone doesn't know, and yet they satisfy all the conditions for knowledge under a given account. We have all the ingredients on the recipe, but we don't end up with the finished product we were after. The original Gettier cases aim to show that the tripartite view of knowledge was insufficient, that justified true belief wasn't enough for knowledge, and Goldman's Barnes suggested that the No False Lemmas account was likewise insufficient. We ended part one with a defeasibility account of knowledge, which adds a fourth ingredient to the tripartite account. Today, we're going to start with the defeasibility account and then move on to two other approaches to knowledge, which rather than adding a fourth ingredient, stick with three and replace the justification condition with something else. Reliabilism, where knowledge requires a reliable connection between our having a belief and it being true. And a virtue account, where knowledge requires that we've exercised our intellectual virtues in arriving at our true beliefs. The quest for the right account of knowledge is ongoing, and we don't have the time together here to discuss every battle and milestone along the way. What I can do is present you with some live options in the debate. Both reliabilism and virtue accounts have their staunch defenders among epistemologists working today, and leave you with the tools to think critically about what it might mean to know something and how philosophers go about testing a candidate recipe. <laughs> Feasibility adds a fourth ingredient to justification, truth and belief, that there is no piece of evidence out there that would defeat my justification. In part one, we saw that the defeasibility account correctly rules out the original Gettier cases and Goldman's Barnes as examples of knowledge. Now I want to turn to our other test. Defeasibility also seems to correctly rule in cases we would con commonly consider to be instances of knowing. Take a straightforward case. I'm currently in Glasgow. I count as knowing that I'm in Glasgow because it's true that I'm in Glasgow. I believe that I'm in Glasgow. I'm justified in this belief. My memory, my perception, the testimony of others gives me good evidence. And there is no further true proposition such that if I came to believe it, I would no longer be justified in believing that I'm in Glasgow. For instance, it's not true that I'm dreaming or that I've taken a hallucinogen or that aliens have transported me to a Glasgow facade on a distant planet. I have an indefeasibly justified true belief. Okay, we get the right answer here too. Looks promising. But. There's almost always a but. Just like Gettier put a spanner in the works for JTB, and Goldman's Barnes did the same for No False Lemmas, there are cases that cast doubt on defeasibility. These are cases with defeater defeaters. For example, suppose that you hear that your favourite director is releasing a new film, and you say to a friend, I know I'll enjoy that. Suppose that you believe it, it's true, and that your belief is justified. Your experience of the director's prior work gives you good reason for your belief. Now suppose you strongly dislike horror films, and unbeknownst to you, a film review has just described it as a horror film. This looks like a defeater. If you were to find out about the review, it would undermine your justification. You might think, oh, I liked all her previous work, but this film sounds pretty different. But suppose, too, that, again, unbeknownst to you, the reviewer has a particularly idiosyncratic view of what makes a horror film, as well as a phobia of mushrooms, and labelled it a horror on that basis. That looks like a defeater-defeater. If you found it out, it would reinstate your justification, and thus your knowledge. In its original formulation, the fourth condition doesn't mention defeater-defeaters. It just says that if your justification is defeated, then you don't have knowledge even if that defeater is then defeated. So although you might think that you do know that you'll enjoy the film, defeasibility will give us the opposite result. And if we tinker with the fourth condition to include defeater defeaters, we end up getting the wrong answer on cases that the old version got right. Recall the barn case from last time. 
you're driving along a road, see a barn, and come to believe that is a barn. Unbeknownst to you, it's a matter of luck that you happen to point to a real barn, because every other barn-like structure in the vicinity is a facade. In this case, your claim to know that is a barn is generally thought to be incorrect. It's not a case of knowledge. However, on the modified defeasibility account, you do know that that is a barn because it's true that it's a barn, you believe it, you're justified in believing it because you're perceiving something that looks like a barn, and although there is a defeater that most edifices in the area are facades, there is also a defeater defeater that you are looking at the only real barn around here. The fact of the latter means that your justification, and thus your knowledge, is reinstated. So you know it's a barn. It's worth noting that you don't have to have access to these defeaters, or defeater defeaters, or defeater defeater defeaters. It's not necessary that you come to gain any extra evidence, just that if you were to, your justification would be affected. According to the defeasibility account, that there exists such evidence is enough. And that gives us some counterintuitive results. So what we need is an account of knowledge that rules out barn type cases, but rules in cases like the new film. There have been various accounts that have attempted to do this, either by adding a new fourth ingredient or modifying the justification requirement, or indeed replacing the justification requirement with something new. I'm going to turn now to two accounts of the latter type, reliabilism, which we might call RTB rather than JTB, and a virtue account, or VTB. According to the reliabilist, in order for a true belief to count as knowledge, there must be a reliable connection between the belief and its truth. Or there should be a reliable process at play, rather than mere luck. There are various ways to formulate the reliabilist recipe for knowledge, but here's one I like. It's what's called a counterfactual definition. I know that the Earth orbits the Sun, if and only if. It's true that the Earth orbits the Sun. I believe that the Earth orbits the Sun on the basis of some evidence. And if it weren't true that the Earth orbits the Sun, I wouldn't believe it on the basis of that evidence. The evidence in question might be perceptual, perhaps I used my trusty telescope to determine that the Earth orbits the Sun, or it might be of a different kind, it might be testimonial, if I've learned that the Earth orbits the Sun from a teacher or a textbook. One way to think of it, and this is following Goldman who wrote the Barnes case, is that under reliabilism, in order for my beliefs to count as knowledge, the process by which I arrive at my true belief has to be reliable, in the sense that if I made the same kind of judgments in relevantly similar circumstances, the belief would continue to turn out true. This is meant to rule out the luck of the Gettier style cases. In the barn case, for example, although I happen to be right when I claim that the particular structure is a barn, if I'd been pointing to any other structure in the area, all of which look the same, that is, which provide me with the same perceptual evidence, I'd have been wrong. Although we frequently think that our visual perception is reliable, in these particular circumstances, in a land of barn facades, it fails to be. There is a sense in which reliabilism is modifying the justification condition, although reliabilists stress the difference between their justification and the traditional account. What matters for the reliabilist is this reliable connection between why you believed something and why it was true. I think the following is a helpful analogy for understanding reliabilism. Imagine that you have a thermometer and it reads 20 degrees Celsius, which by Scottish standards is truly glorious. There are three possibilities in terms of how the temperature reading relates to the world. One, the thermometer is not functioning properly and it's not really 20 degrees. Two, the thermometer is not functioning properly, but it is coincidentally 20 degrees. And three, it is functioning properly and it is therefore 20 degrees. The thermometer incorrectly showing 20 degrees is like a case where we have a false belief. The thermometer correctly but coincidentally showing 20 degrees is like a lucky true belief, like in the Barnes case. But when the thermometer is functioning properly, that's analogous to a case of knowledge. In the third case, there is what we might call a law-like connection between the thermometer and the temperature, such that the thermometer will show 20 degrees if and only if it is indeed 20 degrees. In other words, the thermometer is reliable. Some reliabilists, like Goldman, focus on a reliable process, but David Armstrong spells things out in terms of indicators. Your reliable thermometer is a good indicator of temperature. 
Likewise, he thinks, when we're functioning properly, we're good indicators of states of affairs. When I see something red and come to believe there's something red over there, then when I'm functioning well, it's a good indicator that there is indeed something red over there. Of course, there are circumstances when I'm less reliable, for instance, if I'm in a nightclub with coloured lighting. Of course, the thermometer doesn't know it's telling the right temperature, and we might not know that the process we're using is reliable, or that we're currently reliable indicators of the truth. Reliabilism is what's called an externalist theory. That means that what makes us justified in our beliefs, what makes them reliable, needn't be something that we have conscious access to, but rather is a feature of the world. One of the ways that people push back against reliabilism is to argue that we do need internal access to our justification. For instance, Lara writes, more than the possession of correct information is required for knowledge, one must have some way of knowing that the information is correct. Reliabilism is a live position in epistemology, but it's not the only live position. One last potential recipe for knowledge that I want to finish off with is a virtue account. There are lots of different formulations. I'm going to present one which we might call VTB. It goes like this. I know I'm in Glasgow, if and only if. It's true that I'm in Glasgow. I believe that I'm in Glasgow. And my true belief is a result of my exercising my intellectual virtues. What counts as an intellectual virtue differs between accounts. They can be faculties, like having a good memory, or traits, like caring about the truth, or some combination of the two. Ernest Sosa has suggested that we evaluate knowledge just as we do other kinds of performance, using archery as an analogy. An archer's shot can be accurate if it hits the target, adroit if the archer shoots skillfully, and apt if the arrow hits the target because it was shot skillfully. The shot might be accurate without being adroit if it hits the target by luck even if it was shot badly. It could be adroit without being accurate if it was shot well but a sudden strong wind blew it off course. But if it hits because it was shot well, then it is apt. More generally, a performance is accurate if it achieves its aim, adroit if it manifests competence, and apt if it is accurate because it is adroit. So we might interpret the third ingredient of the virtue account in terms of aptness. I know that I'm in Glasgow if my true belief is apt, if it is accurate, true, because it is adroit, that is, because I was intellectually competent. Something that reliabilism and virtue accounts tend to have in common is that they stipulate that knowledge is non-accidentally formed true belief. True beliefs have to be caused in the right way or arise via the right kind of process, although accounts differ as to what the right way is. There's ongoing debate as to whether virtue accounts give the right answer in Gettier type cases. On the one hand, some argue that agents in these cases don't form their beliefs as the result of exercising their intellectual virtues. But on the other, some have questioned whether we have an adequate understanding of what it is to act as a result of intellectual virtue. Another worry some have about certain virtue accounts is that they seem to rule out animals and young children having knowledge. We ordinarily say things like, an ant knows where its nest is, or a baby knows when her mum is speaking. But if the intellectual virtues required for knowledge are cultivated traits like caring about the truth or being open-minded, it's hard to see how ants and babies could meet that bar. We've considered a variety of different accounts of knowledge. Justified true belief, justified true belief plus other ingredients like no false premises or no defeaters. We've thought about replacing justification with other conditions, like a reliable connection between having the belief and its being true, or the true belief being apt, the result of our intellectual virtues. So what's the right recipe for knowledge? I don't know. Which do you find most appealing? Does any match your intuitions of what it means to have knowledge? Does it rule out what you need it to and capture what it should? Feel free to get in touch and let me know. You can find me on Twitter at Epicurean Cure. And try out the thought experiments on your friends. Philosophy is best when shared. Thanks for letting me share it with you.